What do you think of when I say BDD? Maybe you think of the gherkin language, cucumber and spec flow. Maybe you think of the three amigos, business people, development people and test people discussing business ideas together to define the behaviour that they want. All of these and more are part of it. But one of the ideas that I value is maybe a little bit more subtle and so often missed, I think. It's the degree to which BDD can join the dots in your development process. I think that behaviour-driven development can be the grease in the wheels that helps us great teams to do great work. So how do we apply the grease that's part of BDD and how do we make it work? Hi, I'm Dave Farley of Continuous Delivery. Welcome to my channel. Uh, if you haven't been here before, uh, please do hit subscribe. And if you enjoy the content today, hit like as well. I'd like to begin by thanking our sponsors, Harness, Eco Experts, Octopus and Specflow. They're all helping us to develop our channel. So please do check out their links in the description below. My book on continuous delivery pipelines is out now on paperback on Amazon. So check that out too. BDD is a recurring theme on this channel. That's because I think that it's one of the ideas that can really help lift software development from something a bit unstructured and ad hoc towards something that's more directed, more disciplined even, and certainly more effective. This is about a lot more than merely writing a few functional tests, and certainly more than only the tools that support a particular style of functional testing. This is about organising our thinking and our work in a way that reduces misunderstandings, focuses our work on what is, imp what is important and what really matters, and verifying that what we've achieved is what we set out to achieve. When done well, BDD does all of these things and several more. So in this episode, I want to explore the role of BDD in acceptance testing and specifically how it joins the dots in the development process. So I'm going to describe how we help ourselves by using the language of the problem domain, how we focus on the behaviour of our systems, and I'll go on to give you a worked example of what this looks like in practice. Before we get too deep into this topic in this episode though, uh, let me remind you, uh, BDD is more than only these sorts of high level functional tests. I talk about that in this video in a bit more detail, TDD versus BDD. Software development is an exercise in modeling really. We're always cre creating code representations of the problems that we're solving. Whether we think of these things as models or not, they are. Wikipedia defines a model as an informative representation of an object, person or system. Pretty sure that covers any code that I'm ever likely to write. Though we could argue about whether that's informative or not if I'm having a bad day. One of the principles that has guided my approach to software design for a very long time, even predating the book that describes it so well, is to consciously attempt to base my models as clearly as I can on the problem domain. This is what Eric Evans' book, Domain Driven Design, is really all about. Our code should be little simulations, executable models of the problems that we're trying to solve. If we approach our work in this way, it tends to guide us in some healthy directions. One of the ideas that's central to the domain-driven design book and thinking is the idea of ubiquitous language. The ubiquitous language is the language that a team agrees upon to describe ideas in the problem domain. It's called ubiquitous because the idea is that it's used everywhere. It's how we talk to each other when we're exploring ideas. It's, how the, it's the language that business people use to talk to each other about business ideas, or at least those ideas in the bits of the system where we're building software. It's how technologies talk to business people and to each other and about the problem itself. If we get this right, then to a large degree in terms of their function, the models that we build are best described in this language. The idea is that over time we agree on the words that we're going to use. If there are two words that are commonly used to describe the same idea, we'll pick one and we'll use that one from now on. We want our ubiquitous language to be definitive, accurate and ideally lacking in ambiguity. 
We'll correct our colleagues if they inadvertently use the old words or misuse others. Over time, this means that our communication gets more and more accurate. There's a significantly less room for misunderstanding because we're going to use this same language to talk about the problem that we are solving and about the solutions that we create. This also has the nice side effect that, as developers, it helps us to grow our learning of the problem domain, which can only be, help us to do a better job. At this point, I can imagine you thinking, Dave's lost it, what on earth has all this got to do with BDD? Well, doubt is in the back row, I'm still in fact on track. Uh, if we apply these ideas well, then BDD helps us to create and to establish this extremely useful, ubiquitous language. In turn, that helps us to build better software, more closely aligned with what the people that use it really want. Another extremely nice side effect is the fact that software that's better aligned with the models inside the heads of non-technical people is often easier to change when they think it's easy to change. So instead of making you feel a bit sick and weak at the knees when your product owner says something like, hey, could we change it to do X? Should be easy because that's nearly the same as how it works now. Then most of the time they will be correct. BDD is about taking a behavioral focus. We're going to work to create executable specifications that describe the behavior that we'd like our systems to exhibit. The best place to begin with this is to define what, what it is that we want our system to do in a behavioral way. That is from the perspective of someone benefiting from that behavior, a consumer of the software, products or services that your system provides. If this is making you think user stories, you're on the right track. We'll write down a simple idea that captures what the system does, but says nothing at all about how it achieves that. I'd argue that if your user stories say things like add a, bu add a button or make this text blue, you're doing it wrong. Those things say nothing about what the user really gets. On, they only talk about how you will deliver whatever it is that they get. Instead, describe as clearly and as simply as you can what the user wants to achieve, the behavior of the system. The best way to do this and to stick to the discipline of letting your, your stories say only what and never how is to create your stories in the language of the problem domain and only in the language of the problem domain the ubiquitous language. Hold these discussions that lead to the stories in that language. Be pedantic, discuss which words to use to describe ideas and use those words consistently. Grow your ubiquitous language. The next step is to think of an example. Imagine a scenario where the user benefits in some way from the behavior that you've just described. This is an acceptance criteria for your story. There may well be more than one for each story, each describing a different way in which the user benefits from the behavior that you're adding. Now, write that scenario down, still in the ubiquitous language, and describe how you will tell that the user got what, it, what they wanted. This is a specification. If your system could do this, then you'd be able to tell that the requirement inherent in the story was actually met. So now we have our specification. The next step is really to make it executable. If we've been smart and stuck to the principles that I've described here, then our specification says nothing at all about how our system works and only says what it should do. So this specification is going to be pretty durable. Our system can change a lot without breaking this spec. In fact, if we stuck to our ubiquitous language, then the only way that this spec can change is if the business goals change. We could throw away our existing system, rewrite it from scratch, and the spec would still be true. As long as this behavior is still what we want, the spec's always true. It may certainly evolve over time as our understanding deepens, but it's not going to change for technical reasons. I can't imagine a way of creating test cases that are more loosely coupled to the system that we are testing than this, and that loose coupling is a very good thing to have. 
If our system can change without requiring us to change our specifications, even if we do have to change some of the technicalities, then that's an extremely valuable tool. All of this from trying to establish and use a ubiquitous language to describe the problems that we're solving. I have several videos that describe different aspects of this approach, but fundamentally what BDD gives to us is a way of accurately capturing what our system needs to do in a language that non-technical people who understand the problem can understand, but that we can then take and turn into something executable. Once we have our, our examples, our executable specifications, then we can start to write some code to translate them into real interactions with our real system. For me, this separation between the specs themselves and the translation of their meaning into interactions with the system under test is crucial, central to the idea of BDD at this level. I divide this separation up into this four layer model. Test cases, executable specifications written in the ubiquitous language. A DSL, defining the ubiquitous language so it can be shared between those test cases. Protocol drivers that translate between the concepts described in the ubiquitous language uh, and interactions with the real bottom layer of this stack, the system under test. Here's an example. Let's imagine that we're working on the next version of Airbnb. At some point, we'd get to the stage where we'd like to book a room. Here's our story. As a traveler, I'd like to book a room at my destination. I hope you'll agree that this doesn't say anything at all about how room booking works. That's a good thing. Next, we need an example. I'd like to book this room in Barcelona for three days from July the 15th. And here is my executable specification. Notice, it still says nothing at all about how the system achieves any of this stuff. This is still a very good thing. Let's now imagine an implementation, a simple web page perhaps that looks something like this, only better. Now, there's a link, a relationship between the language of our specification and how this web app works. Of course there's a link, because once we had the specs, we wrote the code whatever its form, to make the system do whatever the specification asked for. So there has to be a link. So we can automate a translation between our ubiquitous language in the form of our specifications into the interactions with the real system that we want to test. Since our language is ubiquitous, we'll almost certainly want this translation to be ubiquitous too. If we're going to express our desire to book a room, we'd like to express our desire to make a booking in the context of a test the same way every time. So we'd like to make the translation of our test scripts reusable. So let's implement that with a few parameters. I call this layer the DSL, the domain specific language that supports our test cases. Finally, we need to translate between this parameterized DSL and the real system under test. I call this next layer down the protocol drivers. At this point, for the first time, we care about the how the destination maps to the inputs. Uh, uh, you know, what does it mean to say book a room? You know, book a room. What does it mean to specify the date on which we'd like to book a room? In this case, maybe we've got one place called destination ID and we've got a field called start ID and we're going to create a translation between the concept of destination and um, start date and these fields. Um, we could imagine using something like Selenium perhaps to type these values into a web page for us and wait for a response. Look again at the specification. It doesn't mention web pages or input fields at all. Now let's imagine a completely different version of our booking system. Instead of a web page, bookings are recorded through a simple function call. Here's my function. Here's the protocol driver. Notice that we didn't need to change the DSL at all, other than to pick which protocol driver to use. And more importantly, we didn't have to change the test cases at all. The specification is still correct. 
I know that my example here is simple. Uh, that's for a couple of reasons. One is that simple examples are easier to understand, easier to describe. The other is that this is a free 15 minute video. What do you expect? More seriously though, I have used this approach in extremely complex problem domains, financial trading system, medical devices, scientific instruments. We even explored its use in genetic analysis once. It does work and it becomes even more valuable as, as an approach as the problems in our problem domain get more complex. So this isn't just for simple systems. At its root, all of this stems from using the right language to describe the problems that we solve. Not Java, C Sharp or Clojure, but the language of the problem domain. The ubiquitous language that we learn and evolve. Using the approach to BDD style acceptance testing that I've described here gives us a tool that helps us to structure, organize and capture our ubiquitous language. It improves communication between everyone involved better focuses our development on the problem that is our real goal and helps us to design systems that are more closely aligned with those goals. And it makes testing those systems an awful lot easier. Thank you very much for watching.